Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Salam Media. I'm your host, Bakir Daud. We here for the second segment of the show. Uh, we're going to be profiling one of South Africa's most loved coaches. He recently assisted coach Peter de Villiers in guiding the EP Elephants rugby team in the preparation tournament. He goes by the name of Aslam Abrams. He's got a rich, rich, rich um, history in rugby. And if you look at his CV, he could easily walk into any job in the country. However, he finds himself, um, let's say, finding those diamonds in the rough. And that's where he finds his passion and tapping back into the community and giving back to South Africa. That's where he finds his passion. Um, I'm joined by Aslam Abrams this evening. Um, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's really, really, really a pleasure and honor, if I can say so. <laughs> uh, Assalamu alaikum, Dakir. Shukran for having me on your show. It's a privilege to be on the show at this moment. Look, Aslam, I mean, yes, it's so nice having a guy of your caliber just sharing your insight on the show. You've recently ended up a preparation tournament um, with EP. Um, what are some of the things that you took out of this tournament, the positives that you took out of this tournament for you as a coach um, playing against some of the best in South, the best in South Africa? Um, that is taking it out from, from my side. Working with Peter de Villiers, it's one of the greatest moments of my life. Um, that first three weeks before our first games against the Bulls, it was something totally different. Different to what I've been um, working with, different to what I've been doing at the moment. And and coaching on that level, meeting uh, meeting coaches as Jake White, coaches as that, made me see, that, see a different side of rugby. Well, oh, interesting. I mean, you guys have had such a good um, preparation tournament. What was it like working with club players and getting them ready to take on professional rugby players? Like, what, what, is, what is the greatest of all is that, that, that guys wanted to be there. They, if we, if we tell them to run 10 kilometers and we want it in 10 minutes, they will go do it and they will try, try the utmost to do it. So they wanted to be there. The, the physical thing of it was um, we were actually just busy for from January up to where we started the preparation where the other guys came through five, six games before that um, Bulls playing in January, the finals of the Curry Cup. And that guys was for, for 12 months. They didn't have any rugby. So I think the, the, the negative side was that we didn't play any rugby before that. But the positive side was that guys could have seen the, the, the professionalism of the other guys. And I think if you have to look to them after the six weeks, we are getting somewhere with them. They can see mm. where they wanted to go. And they I think nowadays they can believe that they can do it. Definitely. I mean, I've seen the likes of um, Innocent Ratebe, for example, playing that final match against the Cheetahs with a broken hand. It just showed that his will and um, how he'd do anything to be part of that squad reminds you so much of the 1995 um, Rugby World Cup when World we Cup, had yeah. players playing with broken hands. Then we've seen the likes of Sian Zuzo that um, scrummed the Cheetahs, um, literally winning scrum penalties against professional props in the game. Um, do you think that this gave them the opportunity to obviously um, get exposed to coaches on a higher level that could see interest in them? Yeah, definitely, Darkie. If you take any um, at, on Wednesday night, the Wednesday before the game against Cheetahs, any wasn't in the squad or anything, and then we got the flu. And obviously, nowadays, if I have got the flu, it's COVID immediately. It's COVID. Mm. So um, on the Wednesday, we practice, and then. I'll fly, I've said there, but the doctor said you've got the flu. So immediately in, he told the doctor, Doc, I'm in, I will play. And same with Nazo, he got injured the week before that. We gave him a break and then in, against Free State, it was something different. And I think the exposure that the guys got saw other people, Jake White saw them, uh, Jatichita saw them, Western Province saw them. So obviously they was, were seen. And I think the Eastern Province elephant gave the guys out there that's playing for the clubs out there. Uh, there's still time for them to get somewhere and play some, mm -hmm. and play on the highest level that they can play. No, definitely. So much hope for club players. I mean, you've seen recently the Bulls signing a prop um, that was playing club rugby in the Sharks. 
um, in the Sharks Union. That just happened earlier earlier this week. Aslam, we talk about your journey. I mean, you've got such a rich history in rugby. Where did your love for the game begin? I think my love began when I was on a young age, when my father took me to go watch vineyards here in Paul. Um, I was privileged to see Salman's father, Nazim, his brother, Zaid, Yazid Murad, Shafat Khan, all of them playing, um, winning the Bolan champions. Unfortunately, they couldn't go play in the SA Cup due to, um, we were, it was Ramadan that time. But I think mm. if they had to go play that year, they would have been the SA champions. So my life started at a very, late, very, very young age. Yes, it's so nice to hear um, someone from Vineyards whose surname isn't Murat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, just, my, my whole family is Murat. <laughs> my whole family is Murat. Just some banter for the Murats watching. <laughs> and yes, if you want to share a message with Aslam, you can pop it down in the comment section below. Aslam, moving on, um, did you play any rugby yourself? Uh, were you any good? Yeah, on good? school I didn't. <laughs> on school I didn't play rugby. Actually, I played cricket at all gym. Mm -hmm. And after that, I played some cricket in Cape Town. And so I started playing rugby in Paul. And then this one weekend, the Falcons was playing against uh, Boland on the Friday. And Coach P came to watch Gardens, his old club. And I was playing first for them there at the age of 18. And then after the game, I've got a call up from him if I didn't want to come play for the Falcons up in Kempton Park. So I went there and my journey started there. Rugby player. What, is it, what is it like going to stay um, up in Kempton Park? We do know that it's not Johannesburg and it's quite dry up there. You being, okay, we wouldn't say a city kid, <laughs> but I mean, you're obviously very, very close to, to the Cape and moving to a place like Kempton Park. Was it a big adjustment or shift for you? Yeah, definitely. And that's where the club, um, Kempton Park, Wolves, came in. They've, uh, they were like a family. So obviously, I didn't. it didn't fall so bad for me staying there. And if I had something, Etienne, the longer they gave me somebody that, that was looking after me. So obviously, I had people there looking after me and it wasn't so bad. Obviously, I missed the home, I missed the family. But I mean, that's some sacrifices that you need to do. Okay, yeah, I see. So, 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 it just shows that like, wherever you go, the rugby community will be looking after you. Aslam, um, moving forward um, into a bit of the coaching and... When did you realize that you need to change and take the next step in your journey to now becoming a coach? And did you ever see yourself coaching amongst the likes of Peter De Villiers when you just started? No, definitely not. Um, it all started in 2007. Um, when I got injured, I hurt my back. Um, 2008, I didn't play rugby at all. 2009, I was appointed by Vineyard as the first team coach, but as a player coach. So it all started there. Didn't do great. Actually ended up second last. And I just felt that something is happening at Paul at Vineyard, at Paul Vineyard. So um, after that, um, I went to go what I went to go sit down, look at my team, and saw that I just needed an eight man to get the connection. In 2010, um, Vineyards won all the leagues they were in. They won the top eight. They won the knockouts. They won the tens. They won the sevens. So that was actually where I started believing that I can become a coach, but not mm. on that level. I can become, a, a say, a great uh, um, club coach in Paul. So I, I never thought that I will become one that will uh, coach a, a provincial side somewhere. Well, talking about a provincial side, you also coached on a national level. Um, tell us more about your journey to to coaching a provincial, I mean, let's say it's a national team. Um, was there butterflies? Was there jitters? Um, what was it like um, donning that green and gold blazer? I will tell you this. is I'm getting butterflies now, just thinking of that. Getting my blazer the day. Um, Phoning my parents, uh, putting it on was something totally different. I mean, you're now the national coach of a, never mind if it's a women's team, you're the national coach of this country. And obviously I was proud. I think my parents were proud. My family was very proud. And it was, it, I can't explain it, really. It's, it's, it's something totally different. 
um, leaving with a team, seeing yourself on the news, getting to a Nations Cup where you, you're playing against the likes of England, Canada, um, America. Yes, everybody thinks America and Canada is not a rugby team, but you go look at the uh, women's rugby, the women's rugby snipes up there. Um, playing against England, you can go check. Um, we actually just lost in the final minutes against England the year before the Rugby World Cup. The year after that, England became the Rugby World Champs for women. So I, um, I will always treasure that memory that we were on the brink of winning the World Champs of the year after that. Uh, my captain, Mandisa, asked the referee to go upstairs due to the fact that there was a forward pass. She didn't want to go upstairs. So if she went upstairs, South Africa would have beaten England in a Nations Cup. And all under your guidance. What an achievement. Yeah. <laughs> you've worked mm -hmm. with the you've worked with the with the with the women's team at that stage. And the women were, well, they should have departed to New Zealand if it wasn't for COVID and the um obviously the tournament being set out. Um, do you think that our national team was ready to take on that tournament? And I went to go watch some of their practices, um, not actually live, but some clips. I think where we are now, um, after eight years, after mm -hmm. I finished there, after eight years, they grew. They really grew. Um, I didn't see much of the others. I saw now the Six Nations. We could have been competitive. That I can definitely tell you. And I think if they started giving uh, the ladies some professional uh, um, uh, rugby players. So I think if we can get professional rugby players on club level, our women's rugby team will get better and better by the day. No, definitely. I certainly think so. So Aslam, you've coached at the national level and then coming back down to, to a club level and relating to these players. Um, was it a massive shift or adjustment? What are some of the philosophies that you stick to in your in your coaching style? It's just one philosophy. I must enjoy myself. And I actually enjoyed myself with this players um, at the EP. And mm. coming back this week, I went straight back to the club, Vignettes, and I coached there. So I'm just enjoying it. That's the most important thing for me, enjoyment of the game. I mean, that's so nice. I mean, coming back to club level, um, were the players um, starstruck when you, when you came back? I'm sure that you had a lot of players um, that had the energy that I had just to be in your presence and ask you so many questions. Yeah, definitely. The, especially the juniors. I, um, one junior asked me, but can't I get a photo? You were on the TV two weeks ago. So I said, why do you want to take a photo? You're going to see me a lot. I'm your coach here. And I think at this moment, um, I'm, uh, um, with me pulling myself uh, at Vignettes, trying to be by uh, Vignettes as well when I'm in Paul, I think that, that is giving the club players the motivation to practice, to maybe there is opportunity for me somewhere out there. No, definitely, definitely. And I think that's a challenge that most of our club players are facing right now. It's like, um, where to from here, and is there still an opportunity for for me? I think that's one of the a lot of questions that are asked by our club players. Aslam, um, you mentioned a story about one of your juniors wanting to take a picture of you. You've got such a love for 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 your juniors. Um, you've recently started a feeding feeding program um, with with some of the juniors, and you've basically brought a community together through that. Can you tell us more a bit more about that program? Um, okay, actually, it wasn't. I was just the face. I'm going to be honest with you. I was just the face for the media. Behind me, there was a lot of people working behind. Um, it wasn't for. It started only with giving food to vineyards, and then it went so big where we gave food to the community. Um, if I check now, my uncle Moti, they are still giving food in Delft. So we never mm. stop giving food now. We actually spoke last night. We spoke at, as, the, uh, as the management of Inyat to now in, in force, maybe every Thursday night, giving food again out to the people. And I think I know COVID hurt a lot of people. But um, rugby isn't the most important thing. Sport isn't the most important thing.
But if we can help people through sport and through rugby, why not? And I mean, that's definitely such a good thing because it, it, it has a ripple effect on so many things. Um, you now obviously giving someone a plate of food gets them interested in the sport and then who knows, the, the next springbok can come out of that. Um, it's just so yeah. many contributing factors to that. Aslam, if you look at it, I mean, we now 2021, um, you've, let's say you, you're so young in your career, um, you've achieved so much. Where to from here? Um, the Akir at this moment, the main objective is getting Eastern Province on a level. That is the main objective. And it's a good thing that the, the club, the club rugby players is playing, starting playing rugby again. So mm. obviously we're going out there now and looking to uh, looking for players. I mean, if you check at the uh, Bulls, the Bulls got 100 contracted players. Western Province got 80. And I mean, we need to go see if we can get contracted players. But our main, main objective, objective is getting the players from the club, giving them the opportunity like this 35 guys got now. And I mean, if you want to take this opportunity, we will give it to you. If you want to play on the highest level, we will give it to you. You just need to take your chances and give everything that you have. And I mean, in EP right now, we know that EP went through quite a dark spell when it in rugby and in South African rugby as a whole. Um, guiding the guys through, guiding the players in that region, giving them hope again. Um, was it easy to convince them that, yes, there is a future in EP and you don't have to move out of EP? Because EP has lost the likes of, um, let's say, namely today, Cohen Bosch, for example. I mean, he could have been playing in that... Uh, black and red hoops of yours? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, you're talking about him. There's Colise, there's Mpimpi, just to name a few. There's Am. Um, yeah. Definitely. Um, um, we want to put the pride back. Peter wants to put the pride back of the elephant back. And mm. if the people believe and um, if the players believe, I think that Peter is on the right track. He goes out, he goes sell the elephant, he goes out to the businesses. I mean, I was laughing now the other day when he said he went to a, a place. The only thing they can tell them is no. And he went there with the idea. And I think if we come back now um, to Eastern Province on Monday, um, they bought it. I just had this great feeling that they bought it. So if a big company, one company out there is buying the Peter de Villiers, dream of the of the eastern province elephants then the players mm -hmm. will get to eastern province we just need one game to turn this thing around no definitely you came so close so many times um this season um and i mean there was stints of brilliance in your matches that definitely gave hope to a lot of people and if you look at it aslam um taking players from a club setup and putting them into into a high performance setup to compete against some of the best in South Africa. What is that like? I mean, um, how much work and effort goes into giving a, let's say, let's use the old slogan that was used at um, Community Cup, where they were working class heroes, if you want to call it that. How do you put them in a high performance setup knowing that they've got a working life outside of that? The Akiri must remember... 70% of these guys still worked with the yeah, by us. They yeah. were practicing in the morning, went to go work in the afternoon. Or we were practicing in the afternoon, went to go work in the morning. Um, it's a challenge. It's a big, big, big challenge. But the most important thing was they were believing in it. And mm -hmm. if they were believing in it and we were believing in it, there is possibilities out there. There is big possibilities out there. And at the beginning, I was a bit, no, it can't happen, it won't work, and stuff like that. But after a while, I believe that this thing can work. If we can just get a big sponsor, this thing can definitely, definitely work, and we can get this player somewhere. Um, our own main objective, I'm going to tell you this, is that um, five of our players, the, the, big, the big unions, uh, need to talk to them. At this moment, I heard about three guys that one Cheetahs is looking for 
the Bulls are looking for him and the Pumas are looking for the guys. So if we must lose them to bigger unions where they can play a Rainbow Cup or something like that, all good. Really, all good. We will be happy for them. You spoke about Rainbow Cup now and um, Eastern Province Elephants won't be participating in the Rainbow Cup. Where does that leave you guys participating um, seeing that you sort of left in the exodus of SA Rugby? At this moment, we free state, Pumas and Creek because we don't know where we're heading to. Um, we'll only know by when Rassi make the announcement of where we are playing. Um, there's a story going around that the that the four unions are going to play in a cup with the SA under 21 team and a, a, a SA 8 team that's going to play against the British and Irish Lions. So maybe there's going to be rugby before the Curry Cup. We are just hoping that we're going to play First Division Premier League. Mm. No, not First Division, Premier League Curry Cup. If mm. we can play Premier League Curry Cup, then we will obviously go look for new players. Obviously, mm. we won't go watch some club rugby. And I think with this 35 players on the base they are playing at this moment and they are practicing at this moment, we can just slot the guys in and we can go be competitive in the Premier Cup. No, definitely. I'm definitely looking forward to that. And I, we can't wait to see Eastern Province up playing against um, the best in South African rugby. But now, Aslam, um, you spoke so much about sponsorship and Eastern Province um, not having sponsorship. We've seen um, not a title sponsor, if you want to call it that. Um, what are some of the benefits that the sponsors will get out of out of sponsoring EP? And how do we get how do the sponsors potentially watching this show get hold of you guys to sponsor you? I mean, it's very easy. They can phone, they can phone the, 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 the union and they can uh, put up a meeting. But the main objective is, is um, a sponsor must remember, we are not at this moment a professional setup. Mm. We bring club players through. And if you believe in there is diamonds out there, then you will, if you back EP, you will back the right people. We will find that diamonds. I believe that. And like I say again, with club rugby opening again, we will go look for that diamonds. That I'm promising you. Um, maybe there's some Pimpi again. We won't know. Maybe there's some Am again. But we will go look for that. And that is our main objective, to go find them. And I mean, you don't have to look too far. I mean, Eastern Province are always competitive in the Craven Week, year in and year out. And it just shows that if that momentum can rub off onto the um, under under 21 championships and then also take it up into your premier curry cup division, it's it's quite easy to say that Eastern Province will be a force in South African rugby. If Eastern Province can just keep their players, obviously. I mean, with the like of if, if Kervin Bosch stayed there, if Amp stayed there, if Kulisi stayed there, Mpimpi stayed there, uh, what team would have been, uh, would EPF have at? And if, like you said, if you go have a look of the last 10 years, eight of that 10 years, Eastern Province was in the final final of the of the Craven Week. So obviously, if they can keep the players there, and at this moment, we can just teach them how to love Eastern Province. We can't give them the money that the Bulls and the Eastern Province in the Sharks is giving them. But uh, we, will, we will get there. I believe we will get there. And I mean, it's not just keeping, keeping players. I mean, you guys... If you guys kept your coaches as well, you guys would have had a World Cup winning coach <laughs> in EP. <laughs> yeah, I know, definitely. I'm, I'm telling you, um, I work with, with a lot of people. I was on a on a three-day course with somebody like Don Mitchell. Mm. The stuff that I saw and learned the last three months is something totally different. Um, Peter De Valles is just believing in himself. He goes out there and believes that he's coaching it will work. And I mm. think that the, the players at the beginning, they didn't believe. Now they are believing and there's something happening. Like it, something is happening in the Eastern Cape. That I promise you. And I think it's just that belief, um, giving hope to the hopeless. Um, not necessarily the hopeless, but I mean, you get the context that I'm coming in. Um, these players were left yeah. with nothing to look up to and to instill so much um faith in them and give them hope just just put that spark in them again give them give them that list and that 
to play rugby again? We got the player there, CJ. He came from play for the for the for the Cheetahs already. He played for the for Hikwas already, and uh, the last game against uh, Cheetahs, he, we were sitting on the bus, and he just said, "Coach, there's just something different happening here. I've been here all my life in Eastern Province. There's definitely something happening here." And CJ is one of the guys that the bigger union wants, and he actually turned down. Uh, the bigger unions to stay in the Eastern Province to see what can be done in Eastern Province for him and for the union. And that is stuff that, uh, I mean, is giving away a lot of money. You can be honest. A lot mm -hmm. of money is, is just throwing away. But he believes that Eastern Province is going somewhere with Peter and he wants to be part of it. That is the main thing. He wants to be part of this thing that's going to happen there. What a legacy story. I mean, Aslam, we could go on and chat for days. But that's where we leave it for this evening. Um, shukran so much for taking the time out of your evening to chat to, to myself on Salam Media. Um, we really appreciate your time, taking your time out to chat to us. And from our side, we wish you all the best um, going forward with the team. And also for yourself, um, may you grow from strength to strength and become an ambassador for many Muslims in, in rugby, inshallah. Shukran, Dakir, and shukran for you giving me the time. And the only thing I want to tell the guys out there, believe in yourself, somebody will see you. Maybe we, I will see you, maybe Peter will see you, but if you believe in yourself, you will be seen. Shukran, Dakir, and all of the best for you as well, and the radio station, shukran. Afwan, that was Aslam Abrams, the assistant um, coach of the EP Elephants, who have recently participated in the preparation series. Um, they went up against some of South Africa's best rugby teams, and they definitely put up a fight by just using club players. What an inspirational story, listening to where he came from and um, where he is now. It's definitely an inspiring story for every. South African out there. But right now we're switching it from the oval shaped ball to the round ball. We're going to be chatting to Len Moleko. He's going to be telling us what we can look forward to this weekend in the upcoming EPL and PSL matches. Exciting stuff right after this break.